Today is Thursday, uh, September 30th, and I'm William Michael of the Classical Liberal Arts Academy. And I'd like to uh, take some time today, while I have uh, a break from the office, to talk about how children can be taught to fluently read Latin. How children can be taught to fluently read Latin, easily and comfortably read Latin. Before I get into the positive instruction, I want to share some of my own experience, which I think is very common for most modern students. I, I started Latin studies as a classics major at Rutgers University when I was 20 years old. <clears throat> um, in the classics department, you sign up for Latin One, which is a four-credit course, and we were handed a copy of Wheelock's Latin Grammar, and we were immediately immersed in Latin grammar studies. We were learning the declensions of nouns, the conjugations of verbs and adjectives and pronouns, participles, and then little by little picked up conjunctions and prepositions, interjections. And I explain this much, clear, much more clearly than I learned it because you know, today I can talk as an experienced classical grammar teacher and I've got you know, all of the grammar uh, terms and things like that in my head. But at the time when I was learning it, I was lost in an ocean of grammatical stuff. Um, but like I said, Latin meant declensions, conjugations, and so on. And that's what we spent most of our time doing. The entire Latin I course got us through the first half of Wheelock's Latin grammar. And the second uh, Latin course, both of which were four credit courses, got us through the second half of Wheelock's grammar. And that was Latin I and Latin II, an entire year of intense Latin study at the university level. And I did well, but it was terrible. Um, I was just imbibing and, you know, regurgitating all of this grammatical stuff with no real clue what the use of it was and doing whatever I needed to do to get a good grade. Uh, but if you handed me a, a anything in Latin, I have no clue where to even begin to read uh, any of the Latin. And then later in the classics program, you would move up into a course like Latin prose. And there would be collections or selections of readings from prose, that is, non-poetry sources. And we'd read things like a, a, a portion of Julius Caesar's um, history of the of the Roman Wars. We'd read um, Livy's history of early Rome, and, and there was just all these selections. Maybe a passage from Cicero, and you'd read these passages. And I remember just sitting there, looking at these readings, and we would walk through them, and the professors would be explaining all the grammar of all of the words and phrases and sentences, and it was just a mess, and, and there were all these questions we had, like, well, how do we know, how, how do we, you know, approach a sentence? Like, do you find the subject first, or, oh, you find the verb first? Oh, then, you've, then you look for, and there was all this complex strategy for how to go about translating a sentence, and you have to look at the cases and the, and the forms of the verbs and the person and the number and see what agrees and what things go together and what things don't go together, and it might take a whole night to work through two or three sentences of prose. And as I was doing that as a college student, I remember thinking to myself, there's no way that this is how you learn to read Latin. There's no way. Because my kids can be six years old and read English. 
And English has grammar. English has, de- English has declensions and different forms of verbs and parts of speech and all these things. That has nothing to do with my kid's ability to read English books. When I sit down and read an English book, I don't think about grammar. I don't think about wh- you know, where's the subject, where's the verb, uh, what, where, what, what case follows the preposition. I don't think about any of those grammatical ideas when I, when I read in English. That's not how reading works. And so I, I used to spend time looking for resources that taught English reading, I mean taught Latin reading, how to read Latin. Because I knew there is no way that what we learned in school could be the way it's actually done. I just thought very simply... If this is the first word that Cicero says, the the hearer had to understand what that meant. And if he moves to the second word, as the second word came out of his mouth, the hearer had to know what that meant. And the same was true of the third word and the fourth word and the fifth word. There's no way that if you were a Roman, you learned to listen to someone speak by taking in a whole sentence at once as they spoke it and then taking a millisecond to quickly analyze all of the grammatical details of all of the words they just said, rearrange all the words in your head and then comprehend the ideas that were communicated. There's no way that Latin worked like that, obviously. And so written language is simply spoken language put down in print. And so what's true of spoken language must be true of written language. We we must be able to read Latin one word at a time without having to scan a sentence, find different parts of speech, then rearrange everything so that we can understand what the first word in the sentence means. There's no way that Latin works like that. And I knew that when I was a student because I wasn't concerned with just getting a good grade. I could get a good grade, but I really wanted to become a master of the classical languages. I really wanted to become fluent in Latin and Greek because I had future plans for studies and I wanted to be competent in the languages for the sake of those studies. So, I had to pursue this knowledge of how to read Latin on my own. And I started collecting all kinds of books and sources from older teachers and things. And I just never found anything. I never found anything that was helpful. Everything that I could find taught the same dopey method of moving things around and analyzing grammar and all this kind of stuff. And I just knew that that was wrong. That's not how it worked. One book, well, actually, I was reading Cicero one day, and he actually describes, I don't remember where I read it, um, but I know another source that I'll talk about in a second. But he explains the method of how to study because he's he's talking about how to learn Greek. Because in, in Roman times, they considered it a mark of one's learning that he was able to read and understand Greek. And so he's explaining how to study and learn the Greek language, and he teaches this method of translation work. And it's very, very simple, entirely based on the memorization of vocabulary. There's no talk of any grammatical concepts or or, um, accidents of grammar or anything like that. There's no talk of that in this method. What what Cicero explains to do is to simply take the writing of some Greek master, copy out the Greek, and then turn each word into Latin, which was their, remember, which was their native language. So translate the classical language into the modern language in their day. And then write out that translation and then 
take that written translation, put away the Greek text so it's not visible, and then work to turn that Latin back into Greek and compare it to the original Greek and see if it matches up. And wherever it doesn't match up, that's where you either don't remember the Greek or you don't understand the Greek. And it shows you what you need to look into more. And you have the the original writing of the Greek master as your answer key, as it were. And he teaches this this method of translation, translation, translating from Greek into Latin, and then from Latin back into Greek, and repeating this exercise until the passages were mastered, and the student could go back and forth in both directions. And I remember reading that, didn't think much about it at the time, but then later on, I was reading a book called The Schoolmaster. It's spelled S C H O L E master. It looks like Skole master by a man uh, whose name was Ascham. I believe it's Roger Ascham, A-S-C-H-A-M. And in that book, he explains how to teach students to read Latin. And what he explains is that the method to teach children how to read Latin is a method that was taught by Cicero. And when I read that, I said, oh yeah, I remember that. I remember reading Cicero talking about this translation exercise method of of learning Greek. And now here in this book, The Schoolmaster, which I think was written in the 1400s, Roger Ascom was explaining how to use that same method to teach Latin to English-speaking children or German-speaking children. I forget which country Ascom was from. Uh, People moved around a lot during the Renaissance, and um, it's hard to figure. For example, Desiderius Erasmus, he spent time in England and was a friend of Thomas More. Uh, These humanist scholars moved around a bunch, so it's, it's hard sometimes to remember where people are actually from. But anyway, Roger Ascom taught what I call the Ciceronian method as the method for teaching kids to read and understand classical Latin. And obviously it also works to teach children to read classical Greek. So once I saw Askim explaining that as the method, I started working with it in my classes because I was a full-time class assistant. I taught Latin and Greek classes every day. So I started to use this translation method in my Latin classes, and modern Latin classes are usually terrible. It's usually, like I said, this immediate immersion into grammatical talk and tests and quizzes on declensions and verb conjugations, and it's just boring and dull, and nobody likes it. Nobody likes modern Latin classes. I know there are some people who think like they'll They'll spice it up by, by teaching, quote-unquote, living Latin, you know, using a textbook like, uh, what's it called, Lingua Latina. And they think that that will make it better, that'll be cool that we learn to speak Latin, but that's really useless and pointless. That's not the purpose of classical language study, to be able to speak it fluently. That's, that's, that's foolish. What we want is to be able to read and interpret the classical languages. There's no, there's no benefit in being able to compose in Latin. Maybe there's two people in the entire world who need to do any Latin composition. And you know what? If a, if a student masters Latin, he'll, be, he'll have no problem uh, learning the art of composition. But anyway, what I started to do was place uh, a heavy emphasis, because I, I also looked in the Ratio Studiorum of the Jesuits, and I found they they do the same exact thing, same methods of translation and copy work and things like that. So I said, okay, I think I'm onto something here. So in my classes, I I made my Latin classes translation-centered. And what we did every day was we took verses, two verses, three verses, four verses, and we would simply translate them together. We'd go through the translation. I'd explain every word to the kids. They would jot down the translation. 
And then I would tell them to study it, study it just like vocabulary. So let's take, for example, uh, the first verse of, of the Gospel of St. John. In principio erat verbum, et verbum erat apudeum, et Deus erat verbum. So we have verse 1, and we would simply walk through the translation. In is a preposition, means in. Um, principio is a noun, it means beginning. Erat is a verb, it means was. Verbum is a noun, it means word. So in principio, in beginning, was word. Well, that sounds a little clumsy, so we take a minute to explain the use of articles in English, and so we'll add the before beginning to say in the beginning was the word and we'll put the in parentheses so we remember that it wasn't in the actual latin we added it in the english and i'd simply walk them through the translation and then i'd send them home for the night and their homework was to memorize the vocabulary and then we'd come back the next day i'd quiz them on the vocabulary from the verses we studied in class and i'd have them do those ciceronian translation exercises I put the I put the Latin up on the board and I'd say write out the translation. I'd check their translations. Once I saw their translations were were good, I would turn off the projector so they couldn't see the Latin anymore and I'd say now turn that English back into the original Latin and they would work on that and the kids would uh fig, you know get the translation right and we'd move on to the next verse and we just continued that verse after verse after verse after verse after verse through the Gospel of St. John. And the kids loved it. They loved it. They loved Latin class. They loved the fact that the Latin class I taught was the only foreign language class that didn't make them do all kinds of dorky stuff like dress up like Romans for the day or have Roman food day. They didn't have to do any nonsense like that. It was just language study. It was translation and vocabulary work. And they loved it. Once they got the hang of it, they could trend, They could do more and more. We moved faster and faster, and the kids loved it. I started Latin classes at the school I taught, which is an, uh, an ex- a, a preparatory school in Charlotte. The fir- when I got there, there were 12 students in Latin classes, and they were studying the Ecce Romani book, which is published by, what, Oxford or Cambridge? Um, they were terrible students. They hated their Latin class. Um, And when I came in, I started teaching them this translation method focused on vocabulary study. And within two years, I had 170 students in Latin classes at this private school who were leaving the Spanish and French classes because the Latin class was considered the cool foreign language class. And everybody loved it. The athletes loved it because, you know, you've got these cool 17, 18-year-old guys. They're not interested in this silly foreign language activity day and skits and all this kind of stuff. They just want to, they just want to study and, and, and do work. So you take those guys and put them in a, in a desk with translation work to do, quiz them on vocabulary do the same thing week by week. They get the routine, they understand what's expected, and they actually learn the language, and they loved it. And so the classes blew up and filled out. The other foreign language teachers didn't like me because I was emptying their classes. But I knew that this method of teaching the classical languages, and I believe all languages, um is really the key. And as I said, it was the method that was explained by Cicero himself. So, having said all that, I've now been teaching Latin reading using this method, and Greek reading, and Spanish reading, and Italian and French and German reading, using this same method now for... See, that was probably 2008 when I taught those classes, so... It's been 13 years, about the whole time I've, I've been running the Classical Liberal Arts Academy. And I've seen kids come in at age 6 and 7 and 8 and just start reading Latin, just get going. And once they get the hang of the exercises and the drill and the routine, they're just off and running. Uh, my, my son David, who's now 18, he learned to read English from his 
Latin translation exercises, which he was doing when he was six years old. Um, so th- there's just so many benefits to the, to the discipline and the routine of this method. And I'd like to explain how to teach your children to fluently read Latin. Now, the simple answer is enroll them in my, reading, in my Latin reading course. Um, that's simple enough. But I'd like to explain what we actually do in that course and, and why it allows kids to read Latin. And I'd like to um, explain it so that people can understand what they need to do, even if you're not a student, what you need to do to be able to read Latin fluently. What I'd like to argue is that all of the attention on grammar is largely unnecessary. Largely unnecessary. As I said, when we read English, when we speak to one another in English, our minds are not thinking about the details of grammatical analysis, the rules of syntax and things like that. That's not in our minds. We speak to each other easily. We listen to each other easily. I can go talk to my six-year-old daughter in almost the same expressions as I talk on this recording, and she understands what I say, even though I use different verb tenses and forms and nouns and parts of speech and cases and all. She doesn't, that, that has nothing to do with understanding what I'm saying and comprehending my message. She listens to me one word at a time, understands each word as it comes out of my mouth, and that's that. That's how comprehension works. My argument is that comprehension is based not on grammar, but on vocabulary, almost entirely on vocabulary. And our ability to read and comprehend things is not as technical as people try to make it appear. There's a, a popular, um, popular little meme or post that gets sent around on social media, and they'll have a a paragraph of text. And in every word, the the letters are all jumbled around. And the whole paragraph is written like this. It, It has the actual words, and each word contains all of its letters, but the letters are all jumbled. And the point of this, this, uh, this meme is that You can easily read this paragraph even though every single word is jumbled because that's how we actually read. We really don't, we really don't pay attention to the, to the spelling and the grammar when we read. We simply look to recognize words. We look at a word, we recognize what that word is, and we move on to the next word. And it's, it's, it's a word-by-word word process when we read or when we listen to people. Uh, we anticipate what people are going to say because we already know the spoken language and are therefore anticipating what's to come. That's why a lot of times we can get into the habit, which is a bad habit, of interrupting people while they're talking because we already know what they're going to say or we can finish their sentences for them because we're anticipating their language because that's you know, our our minds are working much faster than our lips work and our minds have no problem with the comprehension we're not analyzing grammar we're not looking at syntactical rules or rules of prosody, accentuation, syllable length, on and on. We're we're not looking at any of those things. That's got nothing to do with reading and comprehension. Everything that my Latin teacher taught me about reading a sentence from beginning to end, finding the principal verb, identifying the subject of the verb, identifying the object of the verb, identifying qualifying prepositional phrases or adverbial, we don't use any of that when we're communicating with each other. We don't use any of that when we're communicating. Our minds are much faster and comprehension is much simpler than that. When you look, if you've ever studied Latin before and you've had this problem where you feel like you study and study and you can't read Latin, um, 
I can tell you a quick story before I go on. I was once invited by a, a priest who had studied Latin for years and years and years. And um, he wanted to hang out for a while and talk about classical studies. So I met him in a monastery and we spent a week together. And one of the things he wanted to talk to me about, and I, I talk about this quite a bit, but he said, I've been studying Latin, I think it was for 20 years. And he had a copy of um, St. Hilary's commentary on the Psalms, which was in Latin. And he says, I've been studying Latin for 20 years, and I cannot read the Latin in this book. Why can I not read this Latin when I've studied Latin for so long? And I laughed and I said to him, because you haven't studied Latin. That's why. You haven't studied Latin. And when I asked him, you know, so what have you studied? Lingua Latina. Well, well, Lingua Latina is not going to lead you to read St. Hilary's Latin. And that's part of the problem. I would never advise someone to start with an artificial Latin book, with artificial Latin text that's designed for the book, and imagine that that's going to prepare you to be able to comprehend real Latin written by you know, some of history's wisest and most eloquent men. That's not how it works. And so I told him, I said, the reason why you cannot read Latin after studying it for 20 years is because you're not studying Latin. It's just that simple. I mean, we, if someone studied English for 20 years and came to us and said, I can't read any English, but I've been paying tuition to this teacher to teach me English for 20 years now, and I still can't read this book, we would say, this guy's a con man. This guy who's charging you tuition to teach you English, and after all these years, you still can't read the language. Obviously, you're getting taken advantage of here. And so, what I told him to do was just to use the Ciceronian method, to start and just find an English translation of, of this book, because we can usually find English translations of any Latin text that we'd like to read. But for the sake of studying, I said, find an English translation, and then <clears throat> take the Latin, read the Latin, or write out the Latin, and then look at the translation and translate every Latin word in order. Don't move anything around. Don't skip around. Translate every Latin word in order. And then read the English translation with all of the English words in the same order as the Latin words. And you'll see it makes sense. There's no need to move things around. There's no need to change things. Even if your translation is not exact, it'll still be readable. It'll still make sense. So I left him to work on that, and that was that. But we don't read and comprehend with grammatical analysis. The only time that we need to turn to grammar knowledge is when there's something that we really can't make out. Um, and this is true in English, not just in Latin, but in English. For example, in English, someone will write a sentence and will say, this sentence is impossible to understand because you've used, you're talking about two different people and you've used the pronoun he, and it's not clear to whom that pronoun refers. And so we want to clarify the use of this pronoun he. And what you see is that grammar is used in correcting what's been written. Grammar is used for correcting composition. It's when we, when we read through, when we, when we write something, and then after we've written it, we read through it, and we think about whether it's, it's pleasant to hear and it's clear that's when the knowledge of grammar helps us to look at sentences and phrases and ask, can I make this clearer? Is there anything ambiguous that, that I, can, I can clean up? And, and knowing the parts of speech and knowing grammar and rules of syntax helps us to clarify and correct what we've written. That's the purpose of grammatical study. 
Grammar is not necessary to read and comprehend what someone else has written unless it's been written poorly or it's been written in a way that's intentionally difficult to follow, like, like uh, Latin poetry would be, where the sentences or the lines of the poetry are artificially arranged because of the poet's concern for things like meter. Those lines are difficult to read because the normal, natural, or grammatical order of the sentence is, is changed by this poetic license that makes it difficult to read. And so reading Latin poetry requires real mastery of, of Latin because we often have to read lines that are very difficult to understand when we read them one word at a time. Nevertheless, Romans still heard and listened to those poems word by word. Now, that's been very wordy, and I've, I've said a lot already, but the, the, the main point that I'm making here is that when we read any language, whether it's English or Latin or Greek, what what is most important and most influential is simply that we know what the words mean. It's simply a matter of vocabulary. Vocabulary is what allows us to read or sit staring in confusion at a Latin sentence. If we know the meaning of every word in the sentence whether we know it's declension or conjugation or not, if we know the meaning of every word in a sentence, we'll understand the sentence. And we can, by reasoning, figure out the grammatical details of the sentence just by the context of the sentence that we read. Take the verse from the Gospel of John. In principio... Erat verbum, et verbum, erat apudeum, et deus erat verbum. In means in. Principio, beginning. Erat, was, verbum, word. Et, and, verbum, word. Erat, was, apud, with, deum, God. In beginning was word, and word was with God. Perfectly clear, perfectly easy to comprehend, nothing necessary but vocabulary. I didn't get into the fact that principio is in the ablative case. I didn't get into the fact that apud is followed by an accusative case substantive. I didn't get into the fact that erat is a third person singular imperfect verb. I didn't didn't think about any of that or, or consider any of that when I simply went word by word through the sentence, thought of nothing beyond vocabulary and can easily comprehend the meaning of that sentence. So my argument is that when Latin students stare at a piece of Latin writing and they feel like they can't understand what it says, in almost all cases, the reason is because they don't know what the words mean. They don't know the vocabulary. It's actually very simple what they don't understand. And most students, because they don't know the vocabulary, will have no way to even begin translating the sentence. And what they'll do is they'll immediately turn to grammar. And they'll start working and they'll say, okay, in... Okay, in means in, but there are a number of different possible meanings for in. It can mean it can mean to, it can mean into, it can mean at, it can mean on, it can mean upon. Oh my goodness, it can mean for. Oh, there's all these different definitions in the dictionary for what in could mean. Uh, so I don't know. I just have to keep all that in mind. The next word is principio. And so they bust out the dictionary and start flipping through the dictionary looking for principio and they find principium and they can see that it's a noun and it's neuter, second declension, and they can go through and they're on the second word. They're on the second word. 
And this continues word by word. And, and, and the problem is often that because these words signify a range of different meanings, by the time the, the kids are done, and not just kids, adults, are done looking up words in the dictionaries, seeing all of their possible meanings in all different uses and contexts, they still can't translate the sentence or make any sense out of it because they've got 650 possible combinations for what this phrase could say based on all the possible meanings, based on the fact that this noun could be in one of three different cases, and and they sit there stumped by their inability to understand and translate the Latin. And the reason why is because they don't understand the vocabulary. It's that simple. Now you can say, well, yeah, but the dictionary says that there's six different meanings. And that's right. There are six different potential meanings where that word can be seen used in different ways in Latin literature because that's how the Latin dictionary works. The composers of the dictionary think of all different places where they've seen that word in use, and they include what the word appeared to mean in that context in the possible meanings listed in the definition. But that's really not how the words work. If we look at a vocabulary word in Latin, we can usually see that there are a number of different possible translations for it into English. But if we really look at it, we can boil it down and see what the real essence of the word is, what the real essential definition is of that word. And then we realize that one of the reasons there's multiple definitions is because words in the classical languages often have a literal use and then they have lots of figurative uses. And those figurative uses, that's, that's not a matter of vocabulary and, and grammar, that's a matter of rhetoric and, and you know, interpretation. But if we're intelligent and we know the literal essential meaning of the word, we'll be able to figure out the figurative meaning. And so we don't need to know the 64 different possible meanings for the word in the dictionary. We need to know the, es- the essential meaning of that word in its literal and simple sense. And we can learn that. And the best way to learn that is by actually doing translation exercises. Because when we do translation exercises, every time we learn a word, we learn it in a real Latin context. When we learn vocabulary from a dictionary, we're, we're simply multiplying options and just spinning ourselves into greater confusion because we don't have we don't have the ability to determine which of the meanings is appropriate in a particular passage. And so it doesn't really help us. But when we learn vocabulary in context, we learn a vocabulary word by encountering it in a real Latin passage. We learn that word in its context. And that's how we actually build our vocabulary. It's very different to learn vocabulary through translation than it is to learn vocabulary from a dictionary. And that's why learning vocabulary from vocabulary lists is not the way to go. Vocabulary should be learned in context, and that's why translation exercises help so much with leading kids to mastery in vocabulary. Imagine Imagine a, a, a boy coming to America from China and he sees a word in a book that he's never seen or heard before and he opens up an English dictionary and starts looking through all of the possible meanings of that word. Think of how ridiculous that boy would look to a seven-year-old kid who knows what that word means, uses it every day, Imagine when that Chinese boy starts making suggestions about what the possible meaning of the word could be based on the options in the dictionary. The little boy would laugh at that Chinese boy, how ridiculous it was. And most of the 
possible meanings would, ha- would have no place in that context because of usage and custom. And that's why the way to learn vocabulary is through translation, in context. And this Ciceronian method takes care of that. So, the reason why students will stare at a passage of Latin and just feel like there's nowhere to even begin to interpret or understand it is simply because no matter what they say, they don't know what the words mean. That's the problem. They don't know what the words mean. If I was to read, I'm just going to pull up a Latin passage at random here. Let me just open up a um, Latin Bible on my phone, and I'm just going to jump into one of St. Paul's epistles, jump into the Vulgate, and I'll read... Uh, this is, let's see, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. And the Latin reads, Benedictus Deus et Pater Domini Nostri Jesu Christi, qui benedixit nos in omni benedictione spirituali in celestibus in Christo. There we have our Latin text. And if I were just to read this based entirely on vocabulary alone, I would read this. Blessed God and Father, Lord our Jesus Christ, who blessed us in every blessing spiritual in heavens in Christ. I understand what that sentence means because I know the meaning of every word in that sentence. I know all the vocabulary in that sentence and I completely understand what it says even though clarification needs to be made by looking at the grammar. But the key is, I can read that easily because I know the meaning of all of the words and I don't do that grammatical analysis when I'm simply reading because I already comprehend the Latin and what it says. I go on to the next sentence. Verse 4, Sicut elegit nos in ipso ante mundi constitutionem ut essemus sancti et immaculati in conspectu eius in caritate. I know exactly what that sentence just said because I know the meaning of every word in that sentence. It's just that simple. If we know the vocabulary without even considering all of the details of the cases and the declensions and the, and the, the conjugations and so on, we can read and comprehend the language word by word just as we do English. The comprehension of the sentence is not, in almost all cases, not dependent on, our, on an examination or analysis of the grammatical details of the words in a sentence. The reason why people do that is because they don't know what the words even mean. And that's why they start messing with grammatical details as if that's what's keeping them from comprehending the sentence, but that's not what's keeping them from comprehending the sentence. What's keeping them from comprehending what they read in a, in a fluent and comfortable way is that they simply don't know the vocabulary. To go back over that last um, verse, because it's a little more complicated than the first one, sicut, sicut, vocabulary, just as, elegit, he chose, nos, us, in ipso, in him, ante, before, mundi, the world, constitutionem, constitution or formation, foundation, ut, that, essemus, well, I know it means to be, right? And you can say, well, I don't know what this exact form is. Well, this is a a subjunctive first-person plural form. I know that because I know grammar, but I I don't need that to read and understand what the sentence says. That we may be sancti, that's easy, 
holy, et immaculati, that's easy, immaculate, in conspectu eius, in means in, conspectu sight, eius, his, in caritate, in charity or love. I completely comprehend the Latin, paying attention only to the vocabulary. Can I go deeper into the grammar? Yes. And if I was doing a formal study of this passage, if I was going to teach on it, or I was going to make some argument from it, I would first look carefully at the grammatical details to make sure that my interpretation agreed with those details. But to simply read and comprehend the language, there's no such need. There's no need to get into all of that grammatical detail. Everything I need to know is common sense, is reasonable, based on my knowledge of the vocabulary in that sentence. And I'll go on, verse 5. Qui predestinavit nos in adoptionem filiorum per Jesum Christum in ipsum secundum propositum voluntates sui. Simple comprehension. I know the meaning of every word in that sentence without even consulting the, voca- the, the grammatical details. And I just keep, I move on. I can read this as fluently and comfortably as I would English. And you know what? I can read English and have trouble comprehending. I can open uh, some scholarly article on a topic that I'm not familiar with and have a difficult time reading because vocabulary that's unfamiliar to me is used in the English text. If I don't know the meaning of words in an English book because it's a new topic and there's new vocabulary, I will not be able to comprehend English because I don't know the vocabulary. And that's one of the challenges of reading, uh, you know, continuously challenging ourselves to read materials that are not within our comfort zone. That's how we actually build our vocabulary and become more and more literate by exposing ourselves to new readings, new challenges, new levels of vocabulary and, and exactness in terminology and things like that. That's, that's how we grow in our comprehension skills. On the SAT, for example, this is one of the skills that's tested on the SAT. Students are given a passage to read, and the, the people who make the SAT will select passages that they know the students are not familiar with. They know the passages contain vocabulary that the students don't know from their high school education. And they'll ask them, in line 24, the word such and such means, and they'll ask them to identify the meaning of the word, which they know the child does not know. And the question is, why would they ask a child to identify the meaning of a word that they know the child doesn't know? And the answer is because a a reasoning, resourceful student can figure out the meaning of the word from the context. And that's what that question is actually testing. The, The child's comprehension skills. The ability to read and anticipate the meaning of a word based on the context. And the SAT wisely tests that skill, that ability to anticipate the meaning even though the word's not familiar, to have an idea of what it probably means based on what the passage says. And so, even in English, our ability to read and comprehend depends on our knowledge of the vocabulary. The same is true in Latin. The same is true in Greek. So, I would argue that this Ciceronian method is actually far more profound far wiser than we would ever expect or allow. And as we get into Latin studies, we'll see in modern circles, students regularly struggle to read any Latin, even after years of study. As I said, I studied, I got A's in my Latin classes, and then 
struggled and struggled and struggled to get through sentences in Latin prose and forget about poetry, what we were taught and what was required in our classics courses was not teaching us how to read and comprehend the Latin language. And we simply did what was necessary to get grades. And I may have graduated with a classics degree, and I graduated with honors, so I was top dog, and I could not read Latin. And I knew that. The professors knew that. Other students knew that. We could not read Latin. And yet we were getting A's and B's in Latin classes because we just fudged our way through this this confusing labyrinth of words and forms, really having no idea what we were doing, even though we all completed the grammar study, knew all the declensions, knew all the participles and verb conjugations. We knew all that stuff, but we couldn't read Latin because that's not how you read Latin. So, how to teach your children Latin, how to teach yourself Latin, the answer is very simple, although it takes work. You have to learn the vocabulary. The only way that you can learn the vocabulary, I will argue, is by translation exercises. And this is true for any language. One of the benefits we have is that just about anything that we'd like to read in Latin, we can find an English translation of. And what I recommend is you simply take the Latin text, write the Latin text out, find an English translation, use the English translation to write a word-for-word translation of the Latin into English, and learn the vocabulary in that way. And then practice flipping the English back into Latin and the Latin back into English until you're comfortable and learn the vocabulary words in context. One thing that amazes my students is that after I've taught them to read Latin well, you know, we get through three, four chapters of the Gospel of St. John, and it's, it becomes easier and easier, and they begin to read faster and faster, is that we move then from Latin into Greek. And what's, what's incredible for them is that the Greek, once you know the Latin, when you look at the Greek, it's almost exact word for word, transferable between Greek and Latin, whereas the word order in English might be strange and, and needs some adjusting to, to, you know, to produce common modern English, even though it's not necessary. When we look from Greek to Latin, the translation is direct, and most students will actually find it easier to translate Greek into Latin than to translate Greek into English. So it gets very interesting when we practice this method, and I've used this method to teach Spanish and French, to teach myself Italian, and, and so on, just using the same translation method to learn the vocabulary in context and quickly pick up the language. So, how to teach and study the Latin language, how to learn to read Latin, the answer is what? Study the vocabulary. The key is the study of vocabulary. What is the method? The method of learning the vocabulary is not vocabulary lists. It's not by looking things up in a dictionary, which is not going to help you. It's by learning vocabulary in context through translation exercises. And you'll see that if you learn the vocabulary, you can read Latin as fluently as you can read English. And... Just as you'll struggle to read some English when you face unfamiliar words or unfamiliar topics, you'll struggle in the same way to read Latin in those same circumstances. And the way to get around that is to simply use translation exercises until you learn that new vocabulary, become familiar and comfortable with that new topic, and you add that to your treasury of Latin vocabulary knowledge. So, I hope that's helpful. If you've ever studied Latin in a modern course and found it to be confusing and difficult and felt like you never were able to read and understand Latin, this is why. Because you didn't know the vocabulary. Focus on the vocabulary, study by means of translation exercises, and you'll be able to fluently and comfortably read 
Latin. Now, as I said, the easiest way for you to do this is to join me in the Latin reading program in the Classical Liberal Arts Academy, because I've already done all of this work for you. You can simply start with the Gospel of St. John, work through the Gospel of St. John. You can then move up into the epistles of Cicero, and we'll get into the histories of Caesar, and then we'll work on the poetry of Virgil. And I'll provide, I'll do the work for you to prepare the vocabulary so that you can just concentrate on the translation exercises, and you'll quickly pick up the ability to read and comprehend Latin and learn all of the vocabulary in real Latin context. So, the best way to do it, I will argue, is to study with me in the Latin reading program in the Classical Liberal Arts Academy. And as I said, once you learn the method, you're going to see that you can do the same thing with Spanish. For example, you can take a Spanish Bible, write out the Spanish, look up the English, work out the translation, go back and forth between English and Spanish, and you'll learn Spanish and be able to read Spanish fluently by the same method. So, I hope that's helpful. Um, That's how to teach your children or to teach yourself to read Latin. I hope that you pursue it because if you've been discouraged by modern Latin classes and modern Latin programs, um, I hope that you're not discouraged to think that you can't do it because you can. You've simply been taught improperly. And by changing the method of your study, you'll see that it's not in any way as complicated as those con man teachers made it appear when they tried to tell you that you needed to analyze the grammar of sentences in order to read a language that seven-year-old Latin kids or Roman kids could have read back when those writings were published. I hope that's helpful. God bless your studies.